That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about I Wanna Dance With Somebody. The sixth film directed by Casey Lemons, which is being released courtesy of Sony, December 23rd, 2022. What are Casey's other films? Well, her directorial debut was Eve's Bayou. Oh, that's right. Which just became part of the Criterion Collection. Uh, you know, she previous Before that, she was an actress. Uh, she was in Silence of the Lambs and Candyman, two very notable early 90s films. Uh, she also directed uh, The Caveman's Valentine with Sam Jackson, uh, Talk to Me with, I believe, Don Cheadle, Black Nativity, uh, and we reviewed her last film, Harriet, mm. starring Cynthia Revo. My memory is so terrible, but is she married to... Vondi Curtis Hall. That's right. Which I didn't realize until we discovered their child they have together is in The Watcher. And then you just watched Vondi Curtis Hall's film with Tyrese mm -hmm. called... Uh, I'm forgetting the name of it. With Megan Good. Yes. Um, I will admit, when I saw the trailer, I thought this would be a train wreck. <laughs> But after watching it, it is better than I thought it would be. I would concur with that. Uh... Overall, I would say the movie's okay. And I don't know that we needed it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think that that's the interesting part there. But that it's kind of like every now and then we get a glut of Whitney-related materials. And this coming out the same year as Andrew Dosenmu's Beauty, uh, which is a kind of Whitney fan fiction, it feels a lot like how the Nick Broomfield doc... Uh, about Whitney, which was Can I Be Me, was swiftly followed by the Christopher McDonald documentary, Whitney. Yeah. I'm saying I didn't need it because I feel like it's it's long and it's sweeping. And it's PG-13. And, and we all know Whitney <laughs> did not have a PG-13 kind no, of life. No, so it just... it To me, it feels like a notch above a Lifetime movie and has a has okay production value. I would liken it to that film Aline, that's supposed to be about Celine Dion. Mm -hmm. It. I mean, if you haven't seen that, it. They're very similar, except that you know. Very similar in a way that they're also trying to be so super respectful of their subject that it becomes more of like a concert film. But Aline also tackles a very long time period and just kind of like glides through it like you're on a magic carpet ride sweeping <laughs> yes so this does not bring us to a whole new world no however. so this film starts in 1983 mm -hmm. in new jersey whitney's like 17 singing in the choir with her famous mother sissy houston she gets discovered by clive davis she records albums becomes a huge pop star a big part of the first half of the film though is her relationship with her best friend Robin Crawford which finally there's some recuperation for Robin but because in this film I mean it shows them living together like they were a couple we do see them being intimate ish meaning like they're sleeping together literally we see them kiss once I, I think the biggest indication that they are in a relationship is that they have a discussion about how they should see other people which we'll get into um she marries Bobby Brown, but that is, like, really glossed over. Like, she marries him, kind of a rough time because he cheats on her. Very rapid. Then Whitney goes to rehab. We jump from, like, the late 90s to 2009. Mm -hmm. Whitney goes to rehab, and now she's clean. Goes to see Bobby and tells him, like, we're done in a very gentle way. And then it ends with her at the Beverly Hilton, which is where she died. In February of 2012, yes. But it doesn't show her dying in the bathtub. Instead, uh, something that's visited throughout the film, and the film opens with Whitney at the 1994 American Music Awards. And throughout the film, we even get her talking to her musical director about, he, want, he really wants her to perform a medley of three songs from Poor Game Bess, Dream Girls, and then Whitney's song, I Have Nothing. And Whitney's saying, like, that's an impossible medley. Without uh, breaks. Yeah, like, I can't do that. So, at the end, when, you know, you might think, oh, we're going to see Whitney dying in the tub. Instead, we have her um, s singing that medley. The end. There are title cards explaining, like, her accolades. Yeah, it's, it's pretty basic. Yes, it's a little bit superficial, as then we get, like, these whole, not, like, Naomi Aki lip-syncing to all these numbers. Like, the whole thing. 
Which, if you like that music, and there's a nostalgia factor there. It's, she's a beautiful woman, so it's, of course it's like easy to watch this. Length, the running time, as long it is as it is, like it for me, it kind of just passed by. But at the end of the day, it's like, well, what have I learned or gleaned from this? I agree. I mean, well, we didn't mention the vocals are Whitney. So uh, there was a live, like, like greatest live performances, a 2014 album, and a lot of. I believe those tracks are used in this film when we see Whitney singing Naomi. So, yeah, if you like Whitney singing and you like the voice, and you, I mean, it was very easy to sit through this two and a half hours. Yes, film. and some of the recreations and some music videos, like my favorite, How Will, How will I, I Know? know. Uh, but you get, you know, the filming of The Bodyguard and No Sparkle, however. Well, we don't get the filming. I mean, we get like the one the the recreation of the video for run to you yes where whitney has a miscarriage yeah but but getting to that it's like the obvious things we don't get like i can't even say it's the greatest hits because some some major things are just kind of like glossed over very quickly well the drug use is heavily again i think they're trying to be extremely respectful which is fine but we gloss over the drug use and i think the toxicity the well-documented toxicity of the bobby brown marriage uh and very you know bobby christina's scantly attended to in this well yeah if this movie were a homunculus doll it would be very out of proportion because we're not really seeing like the toxic environment that not only their marriage existed in but that that, that their child was raised in and then ultimately that child died as a result of that and <laughs> like, i mean i don't need to move a camp fest of these two doing who's afraid of virginia wolf but it, although that sounds amazing it, it kind of does <laughs> but uh but uh, we also need to, you know, adhere to the realism because this is a movie where we're using her likeness and everything about her. So why not? Let's just be honest. I've... Well, to get back to what you said about not learning anything, I am super familiar with Whitney Houston's career. And this is a two, hour, two and a half hour film. And the little notes on my paper are like, I mean, I have no notes because there was nothing. So this was written by Andrew McCartan, who wrote Bohemian Rhapsody. So... If you're, you didn't see that, but it, it, to me that also was a film that played it incredibly safe uh, with its queer subject matter. Uh, but also the two popes, the theory of everything, darkest hour. Two popes is fun, but all of those films, my immediate thought is kind of like a little dull. And I think that that is this script as well. I agree. Despite some, you know, the performances, you had said this is like a step above a lifetime film. We mm -hmm. talked about it. But the performances, I think, do elevate it beyond that. You have Clark Peters, who uh, is a phenomenal character actor, has her dad. Uh, as John Houston, I think he does a very good job. Who we recently saw in uh, Defy Bloods, but he's really good in Spike Lee's uh, Red Hook Summer. Uh, and the actor playing Sissy Houston. Uh, Tamara Tooney, who we've seen, all, it, she has a memorable supporting role, at least to me in Denzel Wash opposite Denzel in Flight. I actually think she did a very good job because it's very Sissy Houston like as an actual person is kind of campy and so I think to take this character and I never once kind of snickered or like is it somebody could have easily been cast that's like doing like Sylvia Sidney from a Tim Burton film as Sissy Houston. Yeah, so she did a very good job with that character. With um, got them Patty LaBelle eyebrows. But... <laughs> Naomi Aki, I Whitney's hard <sighs> because Naomi Aki is a beautiful woman, mm. but I think Whitney is known for being the statuesque, otherworldly beauty with this voice and the, uh, you know, like she had this model body and the gowns and I think. Other types of artists, like, like like the Madonna biopic, I feel like that'll be easier because like Madonna's a visual artist, so sure. there's a lot going on. Or if someone dares makes a Janet Jackson biopic, I feel like that might be easy too because visual artists, lots going on. But Whitney, a lot of it was just like very subtle. Her standing there and I... I very rarely got Whitney from this portrayal. I think that unfortunately... When I look at Naomi, though, I, as Whitney, I kept thinking of Deborah Wilson. Or I actually it was I super distracted thinking she looks like uh, if Yvonne Orji. From Insecure. From Insecure. She, yeah. she has a very strong likeness to her. Also so, incredibly beautiful. So she's but. very beautiful, but I just, I, yeah, I kept thinking she looks like Yvonne or, yeah, or when she's performing, I was getting like Deborah Wilson. 
but not being funny. Right. So that was a little distracting. Uh, as uh, Robin, I thought Nefessa Williams was fine. Uh, yes. Who re recently I saw in Black and Blue, and she's in Twin Peaks, the 2017 season. Uh, and Ashton Sanders as Bobby Brown has he had a decent Bobby Brown likeness. Uh, you've seen him in things like Moonlight, and he's an Equalizer too. Well, let me go through my little quick notes. Um, I, I thought a really good scene was Whitney and her mom are gonna perform like Sissy Houston's performing at this like cl club regularly. And a talent scout for Arista Records brings Clive Davis, but like unannounced. So Sissy is arguing with Whitney. She's mad about something. And she happens to look out in the crowd and sees Clive Davis and they know each other. So Sissy fakes having like laryngitis mm -hmm. so that Whitney can go and like open. And I thought that exchange was very cute. Mm -hmm. And then Whitney sings The Greatest Love of All and it's Whitney's actual voice. And it was phenomenal. I also think whoever did the music and the editing does a did a very good job. And I don't know. I I didn't try very hard to verify if Naomi Aki is using some of her own singing voice. But whoever's voice is being used to blend in with Whitney's, I think they do a very good job. So um, yeah, for because we spend a lot of time staring at her singing, yeah. and it's like it's perfectly fine. It's. I mean, I didn't have a problem with it. If, if she were on RuPaul's Drag Race, lip syncing for her life, I feel like she, she she'd be okay. Yeah, <laughs> but it well, you know, because when you watch some people lip syncing in a performance, it's like, oh, not it's, it's not syncing. So Clive Davis, um, when right, right when Whitney signs her deal, she tries to. I got the sense that she was trying to tell him, like you know, like maybe her personal life, like. Because at that point, she's been living with Robin Crawford. So I kind of got the sense that she was trying to let him know that she's maybe not what he, she, he thinks she is. And he tells her, I don't meddle in my artist's personal lives. I only know music and I will always be here for you. And then everyone around her knows about Robin. Like everyone knows that she and Robin are an item. And finally, Whitney wants to make Robin like her creative director. So she tells her dad because her dad's running her business. And he's like, okay, but you two need to like see men. Like you need to be photographed with men. You cannot, people can't think you're gay. You need to be like Eartha Kitt. So we immediately cut to her doing a song with Jermaine Jackson. And then we find out that she had an affair with Jermaine Jackson. Well, a one night. Stay well, home. I mean, uh, who knows? According no, she says that they oh. saw each other more than once. So I oh, feel they, like... they in this film, it made it sound like she was telling Robin it was one time. Well, I think that that was an interesting thing that was glossed over. Because they actually have someone portraying Jermaine Jackson. Yeah. Um, there's, I think that's the thing, though. There's a lot that is glossed over. Because how could you not? There's just so much... To touch upon of course with yes, Whitney Houston that's right so then Whitney tells Clive she wants to act and he goes why and, but but then he's I actually thought Stanley Tucci did a good job as I Clive Davis too. it's a very measured performance because Clive Davis is a very quiet man as, to, as far as we all know so but, he, but there's, there's a warmth that they that they, those two play into quite well like when she's upset about not being considered black enough she's like i, I want to do an r&b album it's like okay let's do that yeah he's very accommodating to her which he should be she made him hundreds of millions of dollars he but should be she he, he goes why and then he goes okay i'll get you a script but he then like several scenes later she goes to his office and he's like okay so and so sent me this script they really want you to do it if you want my opinion i don't like it and she goes well what is it about Oh, like a world-famous pop star who falls in love with her bodyguard. And she takes the script and throws it in the trash. But then she goes, well, who's the male? Like, who's the bodyguard? And he says, Kevin Costner. And then she, like, dives in the trash to get the script. I thought that was not fun because I think also as someone who, you know, listened to Whitney and watched her on TV in the 80s and 90s, Whitney had a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And the f this film doesn't really show that. There are brief moments where we see in the beginning with Rob Robin Crawford before she becomes super famous she's jovial and happy but she's never really funny <laughs> and then throughout the film there are only a few moments where it seems like she's a good time gal and I yeah I, like I wish we would have got more highs and more lows it's kind of all like in the middle 
Well, and the, you know, the, the thing about the bodyguard is that script was floating around in the 70s because that was a Diana Ross, Steve McQueen vehicle that they didn't believe they could do because it was an interracial romance. And it's like, this, this script wasn't just sitting there and landed there. We find out that it, it, it's made... There, there's a point made three times where Whitney gets drugs by having some guy, when she's in L.A., come to her and then she meets him outside. So, of course, she gets rushed by fans and then they want autographs. So she'll, you know, give a couple autographs and then she sees her drug dealer. So she will take his pen, sign the autograph, slip money in the autograph book, keep the pen. And then when she opens the pen, the drugs are in there. Um, I thought it was funny that you know, they give Bobby Brown gap teeth by just putting a black strip. <laughs> and then they give Bobby Christina the same black strip, which looks kind of fake. Um, of course, you know, if you like Whitney, then the music selection is great. And then we also get some other artists like Stevie Wonder, Shaka Khan, and Luther Vandross playing th kind of in the beginning that I thought was nice. Um, but yeah, this movie didn't give me anything new. Like we've just, since Whitney died, it's like the same stuff kind of... Rearranged, so yeah. I feel like there's so many other angles they could have taken some I mean I don't know that I need another Whitney movie but if we do another one can we focus on like like an acute situation like maybe the filming of the bodyguard and or maybe like the recording of a particular album and like her first album and her relationship with Jermaine Jackson and a rehab or something something but it was this is a lot it was shot by Barry Aykroyd who usually works with Paul Greengrass and of course, Catherine Bigelow is the Hurt Locker. You know, overall, I thought it looked okay. If yeah. on, if on the slight side. What would you give this film? I think two and a half. I would give it two and a half out of five. Anything else? No. If you like our shirts, you can buy them. There's a link in the description. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>